Welcome to the quick crash course on the Italian game. Today you're gonna learn all the common plans, attacking patterns, as well as traps of this opening. I'm Grandmaster Igor Smirnov, let's rock and roll. White goes bishop c4, marking the beginning of the Italian game. Now, why did white play this move? They want to bring their bishop out, obviously, plus to target black's most vulnerable pawn on f7. And in some variations, indeed, it becomes a problem for black, especially if white jumps with their knight forward, adding one more attack to this pawn. Therefore, the threat can become real quite soon. What can black play in this position? By the way, I want you to understand plans and ideas of this opening so that you don't have to memorize, you know, a ton of theory, but you can really understand which moves are right and why. So, generally speaking, in an opening one needs to develop and castle one of the primary tasks for any opening. And therefore, black's two most common moves are developing one of their minor pieces, either a knight or a bishop, also getting ready to castle kingside during the following moves. So these are two main moves and we'll talk about them in a moment. Besides those two classical continuations, there are also more aggressive attempts of black and trickier, which you certainly need to know how to deal with, because if not, you can get trapped and lose the game quickly. One of those attempts for black is playing pawn d6. It also allows black to sidestep extensive opening theory of the Italian game and they hope to just play simple chess. Then you may bring the other knight up and now black is already experiencing a little bit of problems because if they just casually develop their knight, which seems like the most natural move to play, that actually is already a blunder. That blunders the move knight to g5. And now you team up against this pawn on f7 and there is no way for black to block. Therefore, they find themselves in a losing position just after five moves of the game. Notice that once their knight is on f6, it blocks the diagonal for their queen and that is why our move knight to g5 became possible. So let's take this back. What else can black play? Well, in most cases, they're actually going to bring the bishop out, pinning your knight. Because, you know, in chess the grass is always wider on the other side if you're playing black. Plus, they're also putting pressure, taming your knight, it all feels good for black. Now, to this you can just play h3, kicking this bishop out. And if they wish to maintain the pin and keep putting pressure on you, they need to bring the bishop back, maintaining the pin. If instead they choose to just straight off, no problem. You simply recapture, you actually threaten this scholar's checkmate on f7. And generally speaking, a bishop is a little bit stronger than a knight in chess, therefore this exchange favors you, life's good. Now, if instead they wish to maintain the pin and bring the bishop back to h5, there is a brilliant combination invented by Legal, at the time world's, world's best chess player. And the move is knight takes e5, will certainly shock your opponents. As not only you ignore this pin, you literally sacrifice your queen, but if they go ahead and capture it, it fails to bishop takes f7 check, followed by knight to d5 checkmate. We make black suffer for lacking development of their king side and not casting their king early. If your opponent is on a diet and does not take your queen, then they'll probably play knight takes e5. At this point you can see why it was so critical for you to include that move h3 and to kick the bishop out to h5, because now you can go ahead and grab that bishop by your queen. If the bishop was on g4, that would not be possible as that knight would guard the bishop and then our whole combo would fall apart. But now that move is possible, we go ahead and grab the the bishop. Now they see, oh, but there is the other one right here, I can grab it. Not so fast, because after queen b5 you come up with this double attack, they have to cover their king somehow, and with queen takes c4 you get back material, now you're up a pawn, you're ahead in development and have a technically winning position. The other super tricky attempt of your opponent is to go knight to d4, the so-called blackburn shielding gambit. It's quite popular and you're highly likely to face it once in a while. Now, Black's idea is that they pretend blundering this pawn on e5, which is no longer defended. But if you got seduced by that pawn, they have queen g5, which comes with a double attack, and all of a sudden you're in trouble. For example, if knight takes on f7, which seems winning for white at first, forking the queen and rook, Black's got one more counter blow, queen takes g2, also with the double attack to the rook and pawn, and all of a sudden your king is also in quite a big trouble. For example, if you just say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and grab this rook. And after queen to h1, it's actually almost a checkmate. Notice that the king can't move forward, so we have to undevelop a bishop, putting it back to that perfectly starting position. And then queen takes c4 comes with another check, bishop e2, knight takes c2, one more check, and black finishes the game quickly. How can you punish your opponent for trying to trap you that way? Well, obviously, simply we're not going to grab that pawn on e5. Instead, we can castle. 
Now your king as well as this pawn on g2 is perfectly safe, therefore now knight takes e5 is a real threat and they in most cases just trade off knights. You can already notice by now that you're clearly ahead of your opponent, you've got two pieces developed, you have cancelled and your opponent is, has still achieved totally nothing. Plus, right now you're threatening queen takes f7 checkmate and they need to cover. To this you can respond with another great move, pawn d4. You're sacrificing the pawn because after they capture it, you've got pawn e5. You want to kind of push that same scholar's checkmate basically, but in this case it is justified. Now the knight is attacked, it cannot move. If it moves, queen takes f7, counts with a checkmate, therefore they have to figure out something else. And the only way for them to try to fight back is to move pawn d5. So you attack their knight, they say, okay, I'm gonna attack your bishop. But you're willingly going for this line because now their king is very exposed. At this point, there is another strong move that you may play, bishop g5. The idea is we're setting it up for this discovered attack. If they're careless and play any move, let's say h6 or whatever, you've got this pawn takes g7 really strong, attacking their queen as well as preparing to grab the rook and to promote a new queen. So that would be really bad for them. Now, what can they do instead? They can't trade on f6, because now we've got this double attack, we're gonna win something. So g6 is probably the only meaningful attempt for them to try to stay in the game. But now their king is exposed, you can take advantage of this. Rook e1 check, bishop covers. And at this point, let this be a puzzle of the day. Just a quick warm-up for you. Please think about this, and if you can't find a winning move for white, write it down in comments below. Another tricky opening gambit for black here, which you guys, the Igor Nation, made popular, is the move pawn f5, the Russo Gambit. Now, as a grandmaster, I always feel slightly guilty for recommending openings which are slightly unsound. However, in this case, it's just a lot of fun, and it's very tricky for black to play this move, especially in Blitz, I think you're going to get great results with it. Therefore, if you're curious, I've got another video about playing this opening for black, you can check it out later. For now, we're looking at this from the white perspective. What's Black's idea here? Well, pretty obviously they're attacking this pawn on e4, they're kind of playing the king's gambit with Black, and if you accept this pawn sacrifice, then they go pawn e4, and all of a sudden it turns out that this knight has no good squares to go to. It can go in this direction because of Black's queen, as well as it seemingly can't go to the middle because there is Black's knight controlling these two squares. And if White just ends up moving the knight all the way back to their starting position, of course it's very passive and Black gets nice attacking position. The way out of this for white is to play knight d4, sacrificing the knight. And that's actually a pretty cool counter trap that white may use. Now, a quick spoiler, for black is just enough to deny this sacrifice, play knight f6, covering the square, and they're having a nice game, it's just a normal, approximately equal game of chess. However, if your opponent is unaware of this and will lightheartedly grab this knight on d4, then they're in trouble. After this, white can play queen h5, that's what you sacrificed your knight for, you just wanted to clear this diagonal for your queen and remove the knight from here. And after queen h5, it leads to a very interesting tactical battle, but white gains the upper hand here. Therefore, we're checking the king, black needs to cover somehow, we capture this pawn, now we are still threatening to move the pawn on the next move, opening up this discover check, so they're trying to counterattack, but we sacrifice the queen because we get it back right on the next move with interest, we grab the rook. Still it feels like it's not over, because black's got knight to c to fork. I told you it's a really bloody battle here. White moves, countering the knight, the knight happily grabs the rook, and for a moment feels like, you know, it remains to be tensed. But after queen takes h7, it turns out that we're attacking this knight, plus their king is very exposed. And that's what allows white to win the game here. For instance, if they move the knight back, there is just queen to f7, sort of very advanced scholar's checkmate. Now let's move on to main lines. As we know, normally black needs to develop one of their minor pieces, for example, a bishop. Known as Gioco Piano, which translates as a slow game from the Italian, but as you guys let me know in one of my previous videos, it probably meant a standard game. And indeed, it is a very standard chess opening, probably one of the most standard chess openings of all. Now, here, let's say both sides just play casual developing moves. Let's say we go d3, black develops, we go knight c3, and black castles. How can you develop your attack in these type of positions? One of the standard ways is to play bishop g5, establishing this pin, and it can get really dangerous for black pretty quickly. For example, if they just play pawn d6, which looks like a very normal move to play, that is already quite a big error. Just because it does nothing against this pin, plus it also obstructs the bishop and it can't move back to e7 anymore to support the knight.
Now after pawn to d6, we can capitalize on this pin and add one more attacker right here, and black is already in trouble. Our plan is very simple. On the next move, or during one of the following moves, we're going to capture on f6, either with a knight or a bishop, and that would force their opponent to recapture with a pawn, completely opening up their king. And thus we have that strong attack for free. Now, to make things worse for black, the most played move by black is pawn h6, a standard way to battle this pin, but in this particular position it does not work, it actually backfires, because now after this trade, checking the king, black has to take it with a pawn, they can't take it with a queen, it will be lost. So pawn capture is forced, and now this pawn on h6 not only doesn't push this bishop back, it is simply lost after a bishop takes, and we attack the rook. Now the rook needs to go, and here the king is totally exposed, why do we go knight h4, aiming to bring the queen out, and just look at this position, we've got this bishop pointing there, we've got this one, while the king is totally exposed. The knight may jump to f5, like, things are getting really, really scary for black. They usually play f5, at least trying to maybe bring the queen over here, but now you have a nice way to finish the game off, since their king is exposed, the strongest move you've got here is bishop takes f7. Totally removing all the barriers and making the king totally vulnerable, now after queen h5 check, that leads to a quick win. If the king goes somewhere here, there is always bishop g5 skewer, so at least we'll win the queen, and if the king comes back to g8, then after queen g6, we finish it quickly. At this point, you may be wondering, Igor, it's all cool, but after I go bishop g5, a lot of my opponents will simply play h6, kicking the bishop out, what do I do next? Well, you've got two options, and both of them are very interesting. One is dropping the bishop back, maintaining the very same pin, and if they try to break it, you can actually sacrifice your knight, and we got two pawns, we expose the king, and we still maintain the very same pin they tried to break. Also, we now have the move pawn f4 trying to open up the f-file and add more attack to this knight, let's say if we've got our rook there. That's one of the very interesting ways for you to attack, now you've got this queen f3 threat, knight to d5, attacking the knight, attacking their king, again, it's a very interesting and promising idea. The other option is riskier, but also is even more aggressive. You can play h4 using that fish and pole trap. Somehow people think that it only works for black against Drew Lopez, but in reality it's a very standard attacking pattern that works across multiple different openings. And now, that's the common Igor Nation stuff. Good things come to those who bait. We leave this bishop right here, but after this trade, we leave your opponent in shambles. Now you've got this open file, this bishop is also doing a great job targeting the king, the knight is under the attack, and because of our light square bishop, we also can push this pawn forward, threatening this pawn f7, which will be pinned. We have so many threats here that it's extremely difficult for black to deal with them. And I understand, some of you guys may turn on Stockfish and say, hey, Stockfish says black's winning here. Yeah, in theory, if black is capable of handling all these threats and play counterintuitive, precise defensive moves. But what if Stockfish is out of stock and your opponent has to play himself? He'll usually go wrong and will be destroyed within a couple next moves. For example, the most played move by black here is knight h7, which is a straightforward losing mistake, because now that gives you an extra tempo for g6. Notice that this pawn is pinned due to our great bishop on c4, and now we attack the knight, we attack this pawn, and we win the game. So that's just bad for them. It's better to go knight g4, because in this case, at least black counterattacks this pawn on f2. You still play g6, you ignore that, you want to push your own plan. Now, again, the pawn cannot move because of our bishop, right? So put pressure down here. And now, guess which move is correct for black here? Just so that you can feel yourself in your opponent's shoes. Guess what? It's not knight takes f2, it's not bishop takes f2. What Stockfish tells you is that they have to find a very counterintuitive move pawn d5, giving up the, this pawn for reasons unknown. Again, if your opponent is not a cheater, <laughs> he's very unlikely to find it. Knight takes f2 is a lot more human move to play here, coming up with this fork feels like, you know, they might be winning the game, but you play knight takes e5. You don't defend your queen, you don't defend your rook, you instead give up one more piece, this time a knight, because he can actually go ahead and capture it. And that is truly beautiful and you win the game. What can he do? If he captures this, bishop, this knight on e5, then you're going to give up some more material. He wanted this rook, right? So you just give it to him. And after he captures it, that allows you to play queen h5 with a check, and after the king moves, that's a checkmate. At this point, it seems like you're using this super advanced counter blunder technique. You blunder so many pieces at once that your opponent is confused and is not sure which one to take. 
Let's say he grabs your queen on d1. In this case, you've got a force in continuation. You capture right here, check to the king. We also control this open file, therefore he has to take. Bishop takes f7, counts with one more check. He needs to move, now rook h8. And after a couple more checks, we get the job done. Here's another extremely common situation you are going to face. What if your opponent wants to stop you from playing this bishop g5 move and he plays h6 up front? That actually puzzles a lot of players because they're not sure how to attack then. And let me show you a very simple attacking plan. Because again, I don't want you to memorize these lines. I just want you to understand those common attacking plans that you can use even if your opponent plays slightly different moves. So here, since your, your bishop cannot go here, it can go here, you know, because of this pawn, you develop it to e3, offering this trade of bishops. And it looks like just an equal exchange, a bishop for a bishop. But in fact, the move is super tricky. Actually, Stockfish says that black should go ahead and take here. It is also the most played move by black, but in my view, it's kind of wrong from human perspective. Because as we look at this position, there are some really good changes for you. And one of them being the fact that now you've got this file for your rook. Let's say he goes d6 and you castle. Now you automatically put your rook to this extremely nice attacking position. You also have this bishop targeting the same square on f7 and they are likely to be in trouble in the middle game. Plus we have very simple attacking plan. They'll usually go bishop g4. By the way, another side advantage of having this pawn right here is that it takes away this square. So they can't ever jump with their knight forward. All right, so after bishop g4, they're playing this move, but here it's totally harmless. I mean, your knight is already guarded, so there's nothing to uh, do here with the bishop. And you've got another common maneuver, queen e1. And that does two things at once. You sidestep this pin, and also you're ready to bring your queen to the king side because we anticipate him to castle there. He will likely to do that. And then at any time, whenever you bring the queen right here, it's going to pressure this bishop, it's going to pressure his king. But now you can also play knight h4. One more move, which is extremely common, that's just part of your attacking plan. You will see how it materializes very quickly. Again, we open up this file for the rook. The knight aims for this square, potentially in the future. We still want to bring the queen out. And we just build up this really strong attack out of nothing. So let's say your opponent plays whatever. a6 is the most common move. Doesn't make too much sense, but they play it anyway. And you go queen g3. Now you have virtually all your pieces targeting his king side. We've got this bishop, we've got this rook, we've got the queen, this knight ready to go, this knight ready to go, and you can see that your opponent is clearly in trouble. What can he do? Let's say if he realizes that this bishop is in danger, and it's true, because you can sack your rook right here and then win the bishop. Thus you'll get two minor pieces for a rook, which is a material advantage for you. If he wants to save this bishop and want to move it back, now you can play knight f5. The additional benefit here is that now this bishop is no longer able to trade off the knight. So we really have this monstrous knight threatening checkmate on, in one move. Also threatening knight takes h6 check because of the pin. This pawn is pinned. But of course the major threat is just queen takes g7 checkmate. They need to cover. And now, can you see the winning move for white here? It's a very common blunder by black here. It's the fact that you can simply go ahead and capture this bishop because this pawn is pinned. It can't move. And therefore you grab the, the bishop and on the next move you still play queen takes g7 and checkmate. And you know, it might seem like black just blundered something here, but I would say if we take a couple moves back that overall their position here is just extremely tough. Like if black really tries to somehow defend it, it's very hard. You know, knight of five is coming. Anyways, whatever they do. Another common blunder of black, if let's say they try to stop this move by going knight e7. Oh, it's actually white to play. Let me play some move just to show you another useful idea. Let's say I play a3. By the way, also a very useful move for white in these positions, because you can see that your light square bishop is doing a great job, and therefore it's useful to save it from trades. Therefore, with this move a3, if your opponent ever tries to trade off this bishop, that's never a problem, because you can just drop it back to a2, and the bishop is safe. Anyway, another thing which I wanted to show, if your opponent wants to stop this move by going knight e7, controlling this square, then they're blundering one more thing. Can you see it? This time they're blundering rook takes f6. We're capitalizing on this pin, and therefore we just win their piece. Moreover, on the next move, if they do nothing, we can also humiliate them even more and play rook takes h6. <laughs> just to show you if black plays whatever, you can play rook takes h6 and capitalize on the same pin for the second time in a row. Alrighty, we're saving the best for lost. The second move is knight to f6, and it's definitely the move you need to be ready to face. Probably the most common move for black to play, hitting this pawn on e4, developing their minor piece, definitely a good move for black. 
What do you do here? Well, at this point you're at the crossroad. You can play d3 and then just knight c3, bishop g5, everything that we've talked about so far, turning this into a very simple thing where you don't need to know any theory, you can just utilize those attacking patterns we discussed before. So that is a simple thing for you to play. Alternatively, there is a move knight g5, hitting this pawn on f7, and while players play this, they are usually hoping for that famous fried liver attack. Because if black wants to cover this pawn, they're going pawn d5, and after this trade, the most natural recapture knight takes d5 turns out to be a blunder because of this knight takes f7. And indeed, if your opponent falls for it, yeah, then you're highly likely to win the game. This time you're forking their queen and rook, therefore they need to accept this sacrifice, but then you go queen to f3 with one more double attack, and now they're having this really unpleasant choice. If they wish to guard this knight on d5, they gotta play king e6, which holds on to the knight, but indeed their king is now terribly exposed. Moreover, you can capitalize on the same pin and play knight c3, attacking this fellow once again, this time you're attacking it three times. And of course, black's major problem is their centralized king which makes it super easy for you to develop your attack after that. If they try to counterattack with knight d4, trying to counterattack something here, it fails to bishop to d5. And that's a check, which means that they have no time to capture your queen or anything. They have to move the king and then you can put together some quick checkmate like this. If instead your opponent is thinking, okay, I don't care about this knight, let me just move my king to safety, it's still not that easy to do that, because if they go back to g8, then bishop takes d5 is literally going to be a checkmate, they can sacrifice a queen, but it's going to be a checkmate anyways, and if instead the, moves, the king moves back to e8, you still capture this knight, now you're up a pawn, their king is exposed, you also threaten this knight on c6, and if they move it, that's going to be blundering the very same checkmate. Having said all that, I'm actually not a big fan of this right liver attack, because as chess players we're getting used to this awkward term, but if you're saying, let's say to your girlfriend that I'm going to use a fried liver attack, she'll think you're stoked. And the other problem I have with this is that people who play this usually know that single trap and they're just hoping for it. But if their opponent knows something and plays something different, white very often just falls apart quickly. Because let's say they're using this also relatively famous tracks their counterattack with bishop takes f2 and knight takes e4. If you don't know what you're doing here, and then some queen h4 stuff, right? If you don't know what you're doing here, you're probably gonna be facing big troubles. So what I'm saying here, if you face this position, either study this line a little bit deeper, you know, or just play d3 and then play standard chess. If there's anything I didn't cover, if you have any questions, feel free to post them down below. And if you want to know how I went from 1600 to 2260 in one short year, check out this video right there.